Welcome to Submarine Live. During this week, we are connecting classes across the world to the wonders of submersible exploration and science. Now we've got two types of session. We have our submarine Q&As, where we are connecting to the Necton First Ascent team who are currently exploring the uncharted depths of the Seychelles archipelago in the Indian Ocean. We also have these live investigations uh, where we're looking a little bit deeper at some of the practical and STEM skills involved in exploring the oceans. I'm here at Sonodyne HQ and we are in the midst of submarine and marine engineering. And today we have an ROV um, scientist live investigation and we'll come to that in just a little bit. So what I'm going to do today is give a quick shout out to the amazing schools, hi, uh, that we have on board. Uh, we'll then do, give you a little bit of background about the Necton First Ascent uh, mission and some of the technologies that are being used. And lastly, we are just going to then look at practicing our ROV scientist skills. At the end, uh, there'll be time for a Q&A um, so really looking forward to having all your questions then. Necton First Ascent is a series of submersible dives, so 50 dives um, at least in the Indian Ocean. Now, the reason why submersible exploration is so important is that we know very little about our ocean. We have better maps of the moon, in fact. And most of the science that has been done to date has been down to a depth of 30 meters. And that's the depth, the sort of depth limit of recreational scuba diving. So most scientists who are not technical divers going down to that kind of depth, which means our understanding of anything deeper um, is fairly limited. The Necton First Ascent team, and I think we've got some footage of some of that submersible diving, is going even deeper. So using these submersibles, a scientist and a pilot can go down to 250 meters. So that's already increasing our ability to explore from 30 down to 250 meters. And really what we're seeing there is that nobody's been down to these depths before. So everything is really true exploration. So you have a pilot and a scientist inside that sort of goldfish bowl bubble of the submersible. And that gives them an amazing 360 degree view of the underwater environment. Now to go even deeper and to look even deeper than that, traditionally uh, marine scientists have used a tool called an ROV. And that stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. And you can see a small one of those on the desk here. So I'm just going to grab it and hold it up in front of the camera. Here we go. So this is a remotely operated vehicle, basically a robot submarine. They are attached by wire to um, a sort of surface vessel, to a research vessel. And down that wire is, is, is both power and a data feed. So you can see on this one, you can see there's a camera at the front. And so you can see what's going on down there. And then the thrusters, forward and back, on the back, up and down. On the top, battery, ballast, all those kind of good things. And really important, if we want to explore deeper into the ocean, now, one of the things that scientists do is they collect samples. And samples are how we sort of understand what's down there. And depending on what tools you use, um, there's different types of samples that you'll bring back. And today's live investigation is really about uh, how the tools that you choose will influence the kind of samples you bring back and how that could influence our understanding of the ocean. Now, it's really wonderful to have with us a great range of students. 
Um, we have Avgulia Linodatu Private School um, in Greece. We have Year 4 from Lauderdale Junior School in London. We have, uh, we have science students from Jonesville and Pennington Middle Schools in Lee County, uh, Virginia. Hello to both of you guys. Um, and we have Mrs. Johnson's Library at Jack Jackter Intermediate School in Connecticut. Wonderful to have you all with us. Big wave. And I can see already um, that we've got some questions uh, coming through um, about ROVs um, from, from those schools. But first of all, I want to test your skills wherever you are. So what you need to do the live investigation is you need uh, some sampling tools. And I suggest that you use sort of just ordinary uh, sort of kitchen implements for this. So what have I got here? I've got a ladle. Uh, I have some tongs. A wooden spoon, a normal spoon, chopsticks, uh, a clove peg, obviously, and a tea strainer, which you obviously have to have on an expedition if you're British, it seems obligatory, but there we go. So what I need to do is choose the right tools to get the samples I want to collect from the deep ocean into my sampling box. Okay, so that's what I'm looking to do. And if we can see, I think we've got some um, footage of um, a submersible going along a wall underwater. A wall is what we call that sort of steep, steep side. And at the front, it might be using a, a grabber to collect samples uh, from, from, that, from that wall, put them into a collection box, sampling box, and bring those back um, to the surface. So let's look at the, uh, the different things that I'm supposed to take from the sea floor and put into my sampling box. So, here we have, I've got a leak um, to pick up. Okay. I have a section of deep sea piping um, designed to withstand immense pressures underwater. And I have a, a sonodyne mug. No, I don't. I have uh, some grains of rice just to make life more complicated for me. And as a scientist, what I'm trying to do is to choose the right tools to take all this uh, and get it safely from the seafloor without dropping it into my sampling box. Uh, so what am I going to choose? I think the, uh, the tongs look pretty good. And because I can see those small grains of rice, I'm going to try the chopsticks as well. So if you're trying this in your class at the moment, you've got your practice items, you're going to select your tools, and you're going to see if you can safely get them into the sampling box. So let's have a go. Gem, how long do you reckon I need to um, get my th three samples into the sampling box. I've got two minutes. <sighs> two minutes. I think that's very generous. I think I'm going to do pretty well. So I'm going to put away my other tools and start me off. I've got two minutes to go from now. So start off chopsticks, chopsticks, chopsticks. Try and get some of the rice, rice out of here. Rice grains, rice grains, rice grains, and then very carefully, I can't drop them. Oh, I've dropped some, but I can think I can just about get one gently onto the bottom there. See if I can get one more and do it a bit more gently, just one at a time. I think I tried to take too many 
first off, that was my mistake. I'm really not very good at this. But okay, stop that. Okay, I've got one grain of rice. I think that's I've dropped five, but I got one. Uh, now let's look at getting a leak. We try with the. Uh, that's not going to work. I didn't drop it too much. Maybe I'll, I'll switch to using the tongs. That's much easier. So very gently taking the leak and placing it in my sampling box. Last but not least, the incredibly heavy duty um, underwater pipe. I think I'm probably better with the tongs than I am with the Chopsticks. Here we go. Ta da! Have you done it? Perfect. Ten seconds. With ten seconds left, if you'll let me off um, with a slight dropping of the grains of rice early on, I think um, I did pretty well. I wonder how, how you got on as well. So that was our trial run. I'm just going to empty my sampling box. Uh, there we go. There goes the underwater pipe, the leak. I think we can leave the grains of rice in there. Now. The team have organised, sorry, let me put the rice down here, have organised uh, some secret samples in my real uh, sampling site. And I've got to work out whether I think I can do everything with a pair of tongs and a set of chopsticks. Um, so I've got no idea whether I should swap out something else or whether I should stay. Do we have any ideas coming up on the live chat? Jan, can you see the live chat going, whether I, I should switch out to something else or stick with what I have at the moment? Stick, stick. Okay, you know what you've given me. I don't know what's behind there, so I'm gonna blame you entirely if I can't, if I can't do anything, so I'm gonna Slight trepidation in taking uh, this cloth off. Oh, great. Oh, thanks. I've got raw eggs, immensely easy. Uh, a, loaf, a loaf of bread, a pear, a carrot, and lurking behind here, the ever easy to pick up sheet of uncooked lasagna. I imagine this was all your idea. So. Uh, do I get more time than two minutes if I've got five things rather than um, three things? I get three minutes, three, three, whole, three whole minutes. Right, here we go. So I don't know what you're trying to move and what you're trying to use. Good luck to you. I've got three minutes to go for all five objects and we're starting now. Okay, so the tongs are pretty easy. Take the tongs, take my carrot, place it gently there, go for the pear. And this is, you know, you've got to be gentle. So if you've got delicate samples on the seafloor, you can't just sort of smush them up. And in fact, talking to Paris, one of the scientists on the Necton mission yesterday, he was very clear that, you know, some of the more jelly-like creatures down there, really, really tough to, um, to handle and, and really using other tools such as video. This is going to be the sort of... Really don't want to break this sheet of pasta. How long have I got? One minute left. I don't know how I'm going to do this loaf of bread. Wow. Wow. 
as I haven't used the chopsticks at all, I might have to try and see if I can do it. I think I'm going to just break a leg if I use the tongs. That's just going to down, go down really, really badly. Uh, going to be a little bit messy and perhaps stinky over the next couple of days of submarine life. We've got raw eggs across the desk. So I'm going to try my delicate chopstick skills to pick up a raw egg with chopsticks. And you can't squeeze too hard because then you're going to. There must be a, There must be a. Must be an easier. Can I try the? Can I try the tongs? Oh, I can't do this. How long have I got? Uh, Thirty seconds. How, how badly can this go? <laughs> really badly. <laughs> so obviously. I mean, these are the kind of problems that research scientists face when they're trying to collect a really delicate sample. Um, and there is no good way of doing it. Ho, ho, ho. I really don't trust myself. Can I hold up to my... How long have I got? Yes, there we go. All of my five samples safely in my sampling box, but it did take about half the time for just that one last sample, the raw egg. Uh, so really what we're looking at here is those kind of skills that you need to be a marine scientist, to be operating um, the ROV. And to give you an idea, I mean, you it's a bit like playing a computer game. So you've got a joystick to control everything, You've got a screen in front of you. You'll be on the surface vessel. And, uh, and you're just trying to do exactly what I've been doing at the moment. Very, very gently move things. I'm not, not going to try um, another, another egg. That was just a little bit too scary for me to, to drop an egg um, on the desk here. So I wonder how you've got on. Um, do share photos of your efforts. Um, and see whether you have what it takes to be an ROV scientist. I know we've got some questions coming through, um, both pre-submitted questions and questions on the live chat. And so I'll just take these off the desk and we'll dive into those now. Um, this is from uh, Jonesville Middle School and Pennington Middle School. How long can ROVs stay under the water? Well, the amazing thing is, if you've got that power going to them and you've got the data coming out, obviously they can stay in, in the water for, for quite an extended period of time. It's really sort of how long the um, operator um, can, can st stay awake and, and, and keep on going, um, as well as thinking about the ocean currents. Because it's attached um, by a wire uh, to uh, a surface vessel, that surface vessel needs to stay sort of vertically, sort of quite close above uh, where the ROV is. Otherwise, that those tethers can be ripped out um, by the ocean currents. Um, surface ships use something called dynamic positioning, trying to stay steady in the same place um, to make that job easier. On the flip side, when we're looking at the submersibles, typically those science dives by the submersibles on the next and first ascent mission is sort of about three, to three and four hours, um, really. Although uh, the life support systems are designed to, to last up to 96 hours, that's four days, uh, typically it's a four-hour dive. And really, if you're looking at a certain area, you know, it, it's really driven by the science of what you're trying to find and what you're looking at. Um, this is, again, from Jonesville. Um, in the demonstration, you said we had to move five items to get our ROV scientist badge. I wonder whether you managed to do that. Um, do ROV scientists have to obtain an actual license to operate the machines? There isn't an actual license, because ROVs go all the way from something that you can build yourself, um, so open ROV, 
these small ones like this video ray up to much larger ROVs um, used for deeper, deeper oceanographic um, research. Um, so you, a background in electronics or electrical engineering will definitely help. Um, and then really taking account um, of issues that you're going to be facing, such as really fast ocean currents, battling against those, keeping uh, the submersible um, steady so that you could start to, to you know, take those samples from deep sea sites. Now, it would be like you were, I was trying to take you know, the loaf of bread and everything else of raw egg, put it into my sampling box, but somebody was you know, behind me shaking my shoulders. So it takes a lot of skill and experience uh, often to be able to do that. The other um, piece of work you might be doing with an ROV is doing video work. Um, so getting nice, accurate, um, constant depth, um, what we call transects. So going along a sort of line uh, with a video uh, to get an idea of the life um, that lives down, down at the bottom. Um, from, uh, again, from, from Jonesville, what is the most memorable sample, rarest or most difficult, that the team has collected on an expedition? Well, there are lots of samples being collected currently on Nectin First Descent. Um, and previously, on the previous um, science um, expedition with submersibles in, uh, off the coast of Bermuda, and one of the thing, interesting things is, is that when you collect your samples, you, you can have some initial interest. You can go, oh, well, that type of animal we don't normally find on this type of coral or this type of sea fan or this type of, of, of algae. So that's an interesting new thing. But in terms of new species, and uh, 100 new species were discovered new to science uh, on the Necton mission around Bermuda, that takes more time and anal analysis um, back in the laboratory. So I think it's, it's just fascinating to start to identify these new species, even if it's not new to science, but new to that area. You can then start to put together a much more complete idea of the ecosystem, so all the living things um, in an area and, and their habitat. And so through that, we can understand the ocean that little bit better. Um, the deepest, James Ford, again, was the deepest depth one of the ROVs has dived. Uh, for us, um, it's rated down to 500 meters on Necton first ascent. And then on, I think off the top of my head, um, the deepest ROV, I think is 8,850 meters. But let me just check that for you. Um, and and, and we, can, we, can, we can come back just to confirm about that from memory. 8,850, although that, that is the height of Everest, so I may be getting the height of Everest in the deepest ROV um, dive confused. Um, from um, Miss Main, uh, the most difficult thing about driving an ROV. I mean, I think, you know, you can drive an ROV in the same way as you drive a remote control to a toy car or toy, toy, toy boat. I think the first difference is it's more like a sort of helicopter and so far it operates in three dimensions. So you, you're really piloting rather than driving an ROV because you're working in, in um, three dimensions. And then it's, it's taking account of the current. Um, so that's just mo mo moving around. Um, in terms of the, the difficulty, it's, it's not just about moving in a three dimensional space. It's also about doing science. So I think it's, it's really that combination of taking account of the three-dimensional space, taking account of the need to do science at the same time, and having all these different sort of like factors playing, playing off each other. Um, I just got, got in that um, an R Divas ROV is in fact 10,902 metres, and that is about um, a just a sort of 100 metres off the deepest point um, in the ocean of the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. So thank you for that for that piece of information. Jack, Jack to Intermediate, do you ever break <laughs> any of your samples? Um, not um, live on air, I haven't. Touch wood. We have never broken, ever smushed, lost, broken a sample ever. There we go. That's, that, that's, the, that's the only answer um, that, that's coming out today. Um, 
here we go. Um, Anna and Stavros, and this mains class, have you ever lost an ROV in the deep? <laughs> Is there a recovery protocol? Um, so <laughs> the t two expeditions recently have both sort of lost uh, an ROV. Um, so um, uh, expedition in um, the Weddell Sea uh, lost an ROV. Uh, so the Weddell Sea is down in Antarctica uh, and the tether broke uh, and that was lost and unrecoverable. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, certainly uh, a, a big blow to the expedition. In fact, and I don't know quite what happened, but I know on the next mission, I think last week or the week before, um, they, the uh, ROV became detached um, from its tether. I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, and is there a protocol for recovery? Not so much in, in so far as that the, but the submersibles were, ab were able to go and collect the ROV. So good news um, on, on, on that front. Um, the, the, so the protocol was that the, the, the submersibles went to, um, to, to find the ROV and, and did successfully recover it. So that ROV is now being nursed back to health and is doing great science out uh, around the Seychelles at the moment. Um, from Forest Grove, great to have you with us. Um, the most unusual species you have discovered. Um, wow, most unusual species you have discovered. A really, really good question. Um, I think that what's interesting uh, in terms of sort of species discovery is that a lot of the work has been focused on, you know, the, the type of sample you can collect. So if we look back to the Bermuda um, discoveries, that it is mostly around, a lot of it around sort of the, the algal communities and, and, and the, the, the sort of coral communities um, on the sea floor um, and the life, life around that. Um, so, I think if we go back to the chopsticks and everything else, that it really depends on how you collect new species. Um, what I'd love to see is um, getting better at, I think there's some really cool technologies that, that will come about where you can almost 3D scan the deep sea environment and some of the life you see down there, um, collect environmental DNA and start to be able to have a 3D model of those species and that sort of the life down there available to you as well as sample of the, of the DNA in the environment without having to take actual samples. I don't know whether that will ever happen, um, but that's certainly an exciting way that science is going. Um, <laughs> is controlling an ROV similar to driving or piloting a drone? Uh, that's from Areti and Ioannis. Um, I, I would love to pilot a drone. Um, Ellie, who often does our field producing, sadly um, not here today, um, so we could have asked her. She, she is a drone pilot. Um, I think there is a similarity in so far as both are operating in 3D space. Um, so the drone operating in, in the air and the um, ROV operating um, in, in the water. But I'd have to, to compare notes with Ellie. Uh, before saying anything more categorical than that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if we see if we can get hold of a bit later to compare ROV and drone piloting. Um, from Lauderdale, how quick do you need to collect samples and why is time so important? I think let's go, let, let's talk about time um, in, in, in the first instance. I mean, the timing piece when we do this investigation um, is really to, to improve your skills base. But if you look at time in the context of a uh, marine expedition, uh, have we done the flyover of the research vessel, Gemon? Coming up, great. So we've got a sort of a flyover of the research vessel. And I just want to talk a little bit about the amount of time it takes um, to put together something like this. So. It takes you know, a huge number of people, a lot of time to put together an expedition of this scale. You are only in the water for seven weeks. Not every single one of those days is gonna be a science day. You might have bad weather, you might be steaming. 
traveling to a new research site. And so because you have that limited amount of time, because there are only so many hours in a day, you want to be as effective as possible. So it is not um, speed necessarily that is important, but it's being effective. So getting as being safe, being scientifically responsible, getting as many samples as you can within this, the amount of time that has been given to you. So there is not necessarily a set amount of samples you get, but making sure that your sampling regime is as effective as possible and getting as, as much as you can or you need. Because it is such a privilege um, to be able to go down in, this, in those submersibles and, and go to these places that it's really be just being as, as effective as possible. Uh, Abgulia Limandati Private School, have you ever seen um, an anglerfish like the one in the Nemo movie? I would love to see an anglerfish um, like the one in Nemo. I haven't, they're a bit deeper than the team are, are studying at the moment. Um, and from, you know, follow-up question from Demetrius and Athena, um, how intense is the light they produce? Well, the, it is really interesting. So the bioluminescence that you see and, and more common in the depths um, that the anglerfish live, that, that light produced by the organism itself, because you're down past um, the penetration sort of like levels of, of, of sunlight, um, that, that light is used for, for three main purposes. Uh, so by different species for defense, for um, feeding, for attracting prey, and also for finding a mate. In the case of the anglerfish, having, having that sort of like, almost like a fishing rod type lure with a glowing end, big sharp teeth, any prey that's attracted by that light then chomped um, happily there. I would love to see and go deep enough um, to be able to see an anglerfish. Um, during the past, um, we have heard about submarine rescue operations. Um, what was the role of ROV, ROVs in these? And that's from Natalia um, Vasiliki. And that's a really good question. That is uh, outside of my experience. Uh, so I've, I've seen and um, heard about the other way around where submersibles have been used to rescue an ROV. Um, but not ROVs in submarine rescue operations. Um, very, very luckily, um, with science submersibles, um, there hasn't been a fatality in science submersibles, touch wood. Um, in terms of sort of military submers uh, submarines, and just to explain the difference between a submarine and a submersible, so submersibles, like the ones um, uh, working, uh, being used by the next and first ascent team, they require a mothership, a surface vessel to operate from. The submarines that you might see in films, the sort of more torpedo-shaped submarines, can operate independently. And these are the, the ones that are sort of more used uh, by the Navy uh, for defense purposes and other purposes um, around the world. And I'm not going to be able to answer so many questions on that, on that side of things. So I know there have been accidents, there have been fatalities, and, and some, and some uh, well publicized ones, um, but uh, you'll, you'll have to um, look, at, look, look at those stories online. Uh, Jonesville um, Middle School, have you ever driven an ROV on an expedition? Um, I would love to drive an ROV on an expedition. I think what's most interesting for me is, is seeing that screen of, of what's down there coming up and saying, can you go a bit further right or can you go a bit further left? But being, being sort of like having that sort of video view live streaming from the depths is absolutely amazing. Um, so I think there's a way, um, so one year we're gonna have to set, set this up. There's a way that you can, from your school or from a set place, actually control an ROV remotely, remotely. So you're sending that signal uh, from wherever you are over the internet, being received by the surface vessel, and then that is able to control the, the ROV. So maybe we can set that up somehow. I've got no idea how, um, but let's hope we can set that up uh, for later years. 
um, INEM school, how deep is the submersible now and how long did it take you to go down? Um, well, the submersible's just come back on deck. It came back on deck just about, um, just over an hour ago um, from the second of two dives today. So the Seychelles are another, uh, I think, four or three, four hours ahead of us. Um, so to Colombia, that's going to be sort of like six, seven hours. So um, it being sort of going to be sort of six, seven in the evening. So important they've got everything battened down. And I think we're probably having a well-earned supper at the moment. Um, in terms of time it takes down, you've got you want a really, really slow descent um, going down. It, it is not one. It's not something where you see this sort of whooshing around. We're going to be looking at um, the difference in shape between science submarines, submersibles, and um, other other submarines um, later in the week with our submarine shape uh, live investigation, and looking at how you want that nice, slow, steady descent. And it also means that you can study the different habitats along the way. So being very interested in how we have the gradation of habitats all the way from the shallow reef down the reef slope, all the way down 250, and then with the ROV down to 500 meters. Um, Pontland Primary School, who else works on the team? So with a team like you have, on first ascent, you've got um, about 11 scientists. Um, you'll have the submarine operations team, um, and so you'll have engineers, pilots, uh, surface um, officers, uh, swimmers, whose job it is to jump into the water and get onto the to the submersible, attach the cables, or detach the cables um, from the submersible as it as it's being uh, launched and recovered. Uh, you've got uh, you've got all the sort of back you've got people operating the ship, you've got the mission director, you've got the comms team. So we did a lot of live broadcasting on the news um, from next and first sent. Wow, you've got uh, the cooks incredibly important, keep everybody fed and very very happy. Um, so there's a whole range of roles um, on an expedition like this. And you've probably seen that sort of overview of the, of the Ocean Sapphire, the research vessel being used. And that just gives you a sense of the scale. I think there's sort of 50 people um, on board at the moment and all these very, very different but complementary roles. Um, from Jonesville, did any of your scientists participate um, in an underwater robotics team when they were in high school, college? Um, that's a really great question. I'm going to have to ask around um, to see if, if there are any underwater robotics teams. Um, I would, I'm hazard that you know these kinds of competitions are becoming more and more popular, um, and I don't think they were necessarily uh, happening um, when a lot of the team were at school, um, and they've sort of taken a sort of a winding route uh, into into this sort of you know world. Um, I don't think it was directly having done it on underwater robotics. If you are doing it, um, that is absolutely amazing. Please do share what you're up to, and we'll share that widely across the whole team on board. So if you do have photographs of any of your projects, if you do have any um, more about the challenges you're doing, do share that, and we will, we'll, we will get that out across the whole team to have a look. That would be absolutely fantastic um, if you could do that, so please do. Um, uh, Seth from Peterborough is asking, what can ROVs bring to scientific understanding that other submersibles cannot? So I think it's the range of tools that you can get down to um, depth. Um, and you know, so the, the, the great thing about submersibles, and we'll probably see this technology, hopefully we'll see this technology extend, is you've got the scientist and the pilot in the acrylic sphere. So you've got that amazing 360 view so that you've got that proper sense of what's going on all around you. And you're picking up information that you don't necessarily get if you've just got a small camera um, at the front. You know, if you just, if, grab this guy, if you, all you've got is that small camera at the front, then you're gonna have a limited view of the underwater world because it's always sort of looking around. Um, there we go. Good old crunch. Um, if you've got that bigger view 
it, it's great. However, there's a depth limitation. So it, as that submersible technology gets more and more available uh, and better and better to give scientists that 360 view, then I think that's going to be absolutely great. They're also more complex to launch. You can, you know, you can have something like this off the back of a, very easily off the back of a dinghy um, or a smaller vessel. So ROVs come in lots of shapes and sizes to be deployed in all different kinds of ways to all different kinds of depths um, rather than submersibles, which are a lot more complex in terms of the de deployment at sea. Um, Kelly from Southampton, hi Kelly, um, would like to know what first got you interested in the oceans? I mean, I, I think, wow, I mean, interested in, in nature for a long time, but in the oceans, it was really being stuck in a tent in the Arctic with a bunch of marine scientists. Um, I was a communications officer up there, and it was their sort of passion uh, for discovery uh, that really fired my interest in the oceans. And the more you study it, the more you realize how extraordinary the oceans are um, and how um, unexplored they are and how threatened they are. So those, those three pieces, I think, really have just kept on pushing uh, my interest in the oceans. Uh, you know, underwater waterfalls, uh, earthquakes, mudslides, you know, just the ocean, ocean, oceanography. Um, all mountain ranges, um, chasms, all this amazing, amazing underwater world that is so unexplored. Um, <laughs> I don't know about costs. This is from Jonesville Middle School, but we can. How much does the average ROV your team uses cost? So I'm just going to sort of slip by um, um, that one. And glow in the dark translucent fish. We haven't seen those um, on this trip, uh, but uh, what you do have is phosphorescent algae. Um, so if you're doing a night tow or the sort of the f foam and the wave action in the water, you can see it glow. So the, the algae will be glowing at night. Wow, there's so many amazing questions, but very, very sadly, we're going to have to draw. Um, this uh, ROV live investigation uh, submarine live session to an end very shortly. Um, how do you get to be an ROV scientist? I'm going to whip through these to be the scientist behind planning what these guys are doing. Uh, study science, especially biology, do that at school, do that at college, do that at university. Be interested in nature. Some engineering on the side wouldn't harm, but not necessary. Um, and just go for science and go for um, exploring marine biology and then using one of these great tools. Um, most important thing we need to ba understand about the oceans, the oceans are huge but they're not big enough to um, withstand the onslaught that we are giving to them in terms of pollution, uh, warming and acidification and overfishing as well. Um, that Thank you from Chris from Stratford Academy. What can we do to help improve the health of the oceans? Uh, and that's from Shim, uh, Shimima at Stratford Academy. Great, great question. Take your pick. Um, I think you've got to look at carbon emissions, um, overfishing, and then pollutants. Um, and look at what is driving those going into, into the ocean or being taken out, out of the ocean. For carbon, just think about how you eat uh, how you travel and how you live, and just examine some of those um, issues. Even if you're, you know, hundreds of miles away from a coral reef, the actions that we take in our lives anywhere, um, if they are producing excess carbon dioxide, lead to ocean warming and lead to harm of the coral reef. So just do examine those in your class. Whew. You have been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, we are coming back tomorrow with more submarine Q&As live from the Seychelles and some submarine live, live investigations looking at the stem behind exploring the deep. So do come back from that. It's um, a big, big thank you to Next and First Ascent, to AXA, Excel, Oceans Education, to Sonodyne, our hosts, 
And if you're enjoying Submarine Live, don't forget you can also sign up for Arctic Live running from the 1st to the 8th of May when we will be up in the Arctic broadcasting live. Sign up at encounteredu.com forward slash live. Until tomorrow uh, or until the Arctic, thank you so much for joining us and it's bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.